Good afternoon folks, welcome back to National 5 Chemistry. I would have to like to have a look today at the topic of radioactivity. Um, radioactivity is a wonderful, one, incredibly handy thing, courtesy of, well, a whole bunch of people, but uh, including the famous names like Marie Curie, first woman ever to get a Nobel Prize, uh, because they were, they were thought to not be capable of getting Nobel Prizes in the bad old days, oh my goodness. And then just for fun, she went back to be the first person ever to get a second Nobel Prize, one for chemistry, one for physics. Um, let's have a look at radioactivity and what the SQA wants you to know. The pages 67 through to 69, um, first of all, they want you to know about the three types of particle. Um, so we'll have a look at the particles involved, uh, what they do, what they're made of, uh, and how you stop them, and how you write them. So there are three particles. Secondly, we'll have a look at um, nuclear equations. How you write nuclear... They, are, they are, sound horrendous. and are actually a piece of, take, piece of cake. Sorry, I've forgotten how to speak today. Nuclear equations. I, and I think lastly, we'll have a look at, not the game, but we'll have a look at the concept of half-life, which is ever so handy. You know, it allows us to check things like how old the planet is. Um, which is quite handy. Also, uses of radiation. Radiation is used all over the place, um, but we'll have a look at some simple uses. Let's start with the particles. There are three of them, which you probably already know, um, but this is handy revision. If you don't, there are alpha particles, which is that symbol. There are beta particles, which will go with a different colour. So we'll do beta or beta, however you want to pronounce it. And lastly, there are gamma particles. Uh, let me just check that I'm not telling you stuff you don't need to know because life is too short. Um, no, we're all good. Gamma particles. So alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, you need to know that alpha particles are made up of two protons and two neutrons blobbed together. Um, so exactly like the nucleus of a helium atom. You're required to know that beta particles are made from electrons. A beta particle is basically just a super fast moving electron. Uh, <laughs> okay, that's it. And gamma uh, aren't made of particles at all. Uh, they are simply a type of pure energy. So we're going to leave gamma blank because gamma is related to the energy that's streaming in through the window here. It's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. But we're not going to go into that in great detail. Um, let's have a look at their properties. How do you block these particles? How can you stop alpha? And the answer is easy. Um, the answer there is a few centimetres of air is enough to do, or a piece of paper. So paper or cardboard will definitely stop alpha particles. Beta particles can be stopped with a few millimetres of aluminium. Uh, and gamma... Good luck stopping that. They can punch right through. Uh, well, they say the SQA say that you can stop them by bars, bars of materials such as lead or concrete. You know what? That's actually not totally true. What you can do is reduce them a lot, but stopping them. Good luck with that. So lead or concrete, uh, and we're talking in meters of the stuff. That's a lot of lead. You're also required to know the. Um, the charge on these, the charge uh, on an alpha particle, of course, two positives and two neutrals means this is a two plus charge. The beta, because it's an electron, has got a negative charge. And this guy here has got no charge, of course, because it's not really a thing. It's just a form of energy. A famous experiment the SQA I like to show you is where you have got a plate here and a plate here. This plate here is charged positively. This plate here is charged negatively, and you fire your three different types of radiation through it. The alpha particles, of course, will be attracted to the negative plate, like that. So that's your alpha path. The beta particles will be attracted to the positive plate. Sometimes, if they're being really accurate, they do that because they're light. They're just a wee single electron, so they are charged, they are attracted really quickly. But we're not going to worry about that too much. That's your beta. And your gamma, of course, say, is that all you've got? and punch straight through not caring because they have no charge. Let's have a look at how to write these, the symbols for these three particles. 
I say three, but the SQ actually want you to know um, four different ones. Uh, so let's have a look at how to write these particles. Alpha is written as helium, because it is like a helium atom. Um, we're missing its electrons, and its mass number is 4, and its atomic number is 2. Please remember, that's the protons plus the neutrons. Go back and check my video if you're not sure. That's just the protons. Um, beta particles, for reasons that have been removed from the course, have the really weird uh, notation of this. They have, of course, uh, they have no mass number. So the mass number is 0, and for technical reasons that are not in the course anymore, so I'm not going to explain to you, just go with it, please. Uh, trust me on this one. Negative one. Um, they also want you to know how to write a proton. Now, I'm going to do protons and neutrons in brown because I can't do black. That was a colour code for, uh, for gamma. So a proton um, is given the symbol, logically, P. Now, I don't suppose you could maybe work out what the mass and atomic numbers would be for that. It has no neutrons, so this is just going to be 1. It's 1 plus 0, effectively. And, of course, it has one proton, do. It's a proton, so that is the notation for a proton. And lastly, a neutron. Now, that is given the symbol n, and the mass number this time is still 1, because it's 0 protons, but it's 1 neutron, so that is 1. And this bottom one is the number of protons present. There aren't any. It's a neutron, so that's that. If you're really interested in class, ask me why that's not zero, and I'll explain to you. So that is how you write the symbols for these four particles. This is their behavior through a magnetic field. And lastly, in the last screen, we looked at how to stop them using a sheet of paper. I've run out of paper talking about paper. Let me go and get some more. Nuclear equations, folks. Let's have a look at how you do these. They sound scary, but they're actually really easy. Uh, they involve, for example, uranium-238-92 uh, and what the SQ will do is they'll give you a clue as to what's going on here. They might say in words it's alpha emission. Um, they might say this absorbs a neutron, for example, and changes into something else. Uh, the clue will be in the question. Um, so, for example, if we had this absorbing a proton, um, what would you form? So what we would do is we would take, this is given to us in the question, we know that a proton has the symbol of this, uh, 1 and 1. Uh, and what you do, guys, is you find, so this will be question mark. It's actually very easy. What you do is you just total up the top line and make sure this plus this comes to the same on this side. So that will be 2, 3, 9. And this plus this will come to, in this case, 93. And then what you do is you go and look up element 93. That's a 9, sorry, looks more like a 7. And then put the correct symbol in for here. I can't actually remember what 93 is, so I'm going to have to go and look up myself. So, in fact, it's Neptunium, NP. Uh, so that's an example of uh, something absorbing a particle. You could, of course, have emission. For example, if you had oxygen-18, an unusual isotope of oxygen, but it certainly exists. Um, let's say the question says emits uh, two beta particles. What would you form? Well, emission means the thing that you spit out appears on this side. So we'd have two beta particles, which are uh, uh, that a mass number of zero, an atomic number of negative one. So what you're going to have to do is work out what goes here and here, and then it would add up to this to make eight. But you've got to remember it's two times that. So this is the negative one. They love using this one because it's slightly tricky. This is going to have to be 10, by the way, because 10 add negative 2 goes down to 8. This one, though, it's nice and simple because two lots of 0 makes 0. So this is still 18. So uh, you would look up element 10. Please remember the bottom number is which controls the element you're dealing with. So element 10 is neon, if my memory serves me correctly. So we would fill in neon, and it would be neon 18, which is an unusual isotope of neon. It would not be normal neon 20, but that's okay. If we wouldn't put 20 in there, you can't, because 20 plus 2 lots of 0 does not equal 18. So these are nuclear equations, guys. 
And the last thing I'd like to have a look at is half-life and the uses of radioactive isotopes. Uh, uses, uh, they're used all over the shop uh, in the industry and medicine, in particular medicine loves radioactivity because you can use it to see inside your body without cutting you open. Thank you for x-rays, Mrs Curie. Um, the, the, the SQA don't actually get you to, uh, sorry, the SQA don't require you to know a specific use though. So I'm not going to give you any specific uses, but what they do love to ask you is why you would use a certain isotope for a certain use. For example, if you were x-raying, uh, not x-raying, if you were studying aeroplane wings to see if there were any cracks inside the aeroplane wing, you can punch radiation right through the aeroplane wing and if there's a crack, it can show up this. Now, they, would, they might ask you what type of radiation you could use to punch through, let's say, an aluminium aeroplane wing. You can't use alpha, of course, because it's stopped by paper. It's feeble. You can't use beta because it's stopped by a few millimetres of aluminium. But, of course, our friend gamma, yup, you could use that. The other thing they might ask you is if you were... Uh, the, the other thing I might ask you is to choose a correct half-life. Now, I can't tell you about half-lives until I explain what the half-life is, so let's do that right now. The half-life is a period of time, folks. It's an amount of time, and it's how long that radioactive sample takes to reduce its radiation level by half. Now, that means all radiation samples do this. Let's say you've got a specific amount of chemical that you start with. So there's a couple of things you can represent with half-life. You can represent the mass of the sample here, or you can represent the radiation level. So radioactivity. But the good news is they both do exactly the same. They both start at a certain time, a certain value here, and every so often on the bottom axis here, which will be time, helps when you fill that in, of course. Um, if you start here, now halfway down is about there. And let's say we call it that amount of time. So like halfway between there and there is there. Halfway between here and here is about there. And that will be the same amount of time. Put some numbers in here instead of guessing. So let's call that 10. So when we go to 20, which is the same amount of time again, this will be half again. When we go to 30, it will be half again. When we go to 40, it will be half again. Half of whatever it was the last time. So let's put some numbers on these. Let's say, for example, we started with 12 grams here at the start. Here will be 6 grams. Here will be 3 grams. Here will be 1.5. And here will be, ooh, in mental arithmetic, uh, one and a half. That would be three quarters, I think. 0 0.75, if my mental arithmetic is correct. 0 0.75. If it was radiation amount, you would have started at, say, 100%. Then you would have gone to 50%. See what I'm doing here? I'm just halving it each time. 12.5% and so on. I can't be bothered halving that anymore. Um, let me find an example of an SQA question on this. So here's an SQA question for 2019, guys. It says that iodine 131, that's the mass number, by the way, has a half-life of eight days. It goes on to ask you what the definition of half-life is. So I said last time, half-life is the amount of time it takes for the radiation level to become half of what it starts as. Or it's the amount of time it takes for half of your sample to decay. That's one mark. That's easy. The second uh, one is, uh, let me just check. The, th the second one is calculate the percentage of iodine-131 that has decayed after 24 days. Which was a three-mark question, which is quite a gift, but there's a couple of tricky things you want to watch for here. For starters, never try and take uh, a shortcut. Okay. A calculate the percentage that has decayed. Now, what do you start with? What percentage do you start with? Well, you assume you start with 100%. So if you start with 100%, after 8 days, you will be left with 50%. After a second period of 8 days, 
you will have 25% left. So we're 16 days in now. So we need, oh look, we need another eight days. So let's do another eight day delay. So you would have 12.5% left of your sample. Is that your final answer? No. And that's probably one of the reasons why this is worth three marks, because if you pay attention to this word here, it's that is the amount that you're left with. That's how much you've got left, not how much has decayed, which is really sneaky. And that's probably why this is a three marker. So in order to get the amount that has disappeared, that has decayed, then what you would do, of course, is you would say, oh, well, we started with 100. We have got 12.5% left. Now punch that into the calculator and you get 87.5% that has gone away. That has how much has decayed from your original sample after the 24 days. Don't, be, don't try and do any shortcuts. Just do it this way, guys. Um, it's unusual because they're not asking for a, they don't tell you the mass that you start with. So if in doubt, just assume you start with all of it, 100%. Um, and I think that was it that I wanted to go through. Guys, oh yeah, of course, yes. Uh, sorry, uh, what would this be suitable for? Would this be suitable for use, this particular isotope? Would it be suitable for use in fire alarms and smoke alarms? No, because look, after just 24 days, you've hardly got any left. So they often ask you if a half-life is suitable for the application. If it's an industrial application, you'd want the half-life to last years. If it's a medical application, though, if they're going to put, and they can do this, they can put radioactive chemicals inside your body, and then you can see the, the flow of your actual blood path, which is very cool. You wouldn't want that to hang about in your body for years, though. You would want that to be just a matter of hours or days at the most. Preferably days. You definitely wouldn't want it to only last minutes, of course. Because then they wouldn't have time to set up the equipment and take, you know, take x-rays of your blood. Because by that time, there's so little left in your blood that you've lost it. So, finding a half-life of the correct length is the other thing the SQA will sometimes ask you to do. Thanks for listening, folks. Bye-bye.